Hi, I'm Keto Dick, and this is going to be a quick video for anybody that needs to know about the ketogenic diet. We're going to move real, real fast. There's all kinds of stuff here. Um, a lot of people say it gets confusing. They don't know what to do uh, with the diet. There's too many things going on. So what we're going to do is we're going to jump through all of the basics. So we're not going to go through any of the what ifs or I heards or any of that kind of stuff. We're also going to assume throughout this video that I'm talking to people that are generally healthy. If you have a known health condition, some sort of uh, condition that you take medication for or see a doctor for, you need to review all this information with your doctor to see if any of this would apply, uh, would affect you and your diet, your medications, and the dosing of those medications especially. Um, so we're going to go through the basics for everybody. Uh, I think that there's way too much complexity in the information supplied to everybody. So what we're going to do is we're going to simplify some of the biggest problem areas in this video without necessarily explaining everything during the video. I'm going to put lots of follow-ups, lots of troubleshooting, lots of question and answers below the video in the comments. So if you have questions about specifics, health concerns, and also, I'm not a doctor, okay, so I am going to relay to you information, and I'm not a do-your-own-research person. I'm a, I did my research, and you can have my own research kind of person. It's all down below. You can follow up with anything that you have concerns about. You can look at the quality of the research yourself. If you think you, your doctor wouldn't approve of it, you should take it to him. And you can review the actual source and materials from where I got my information from and decide if they're any good and if there's something that you want to do or try. So, one of the big things about a diet is that almost all diets work if you stay with them, but the issue is that diets are very hard to stay with. So, no matter what you're doing, if you add extra steps onto something, it gets harder to do correctly, harder to feel good about how you've done it because you're more likely to make mistakes, and it becomes more of a pain in the ass. And since eating is one of the things that you have to do throughout your life every day, you want to keep that as easy to manage for people as possible. So a lot of people will watch this video and say, well, he didn't cover this, and but shouldn't you also do that? And they'll talk about things for optimal health. They'll talk about this factor and that factor uh, that might improve overall health. And, and they say, well, what's the harm in telling them to also do this? Um, and, and the harm is in diet adherence. The more complicated that we make this, the less likely you are to be able to stay with it for long term. And a long term adherence is going to be the best route for us to get larger weight loss because we can lose weight slower and we can succeed over a longer time horizon. Um, this is a way of lifestyle type diet. It is not a good crash diet. You get some really uh, kind of dramatic weight loss in that first week and then it stalls out for weeks so this has to be a diet that you're looking at for months if you're looking at going on a diet for a couple of weeks I recommend going to some other diet but this diet primarily works by uh, the same way all other diets work is by reducing your calories in and keeping your calories out high. It does that two ways. One thing is it doesn't do the uh, effects of starvation mode that people talk about, that they worry about. It doesn't lower your metabolic rate, your basal internal thermal genesis and other things, which we won't get into, but it doesn't do that. So it makes it so where if you're in a higher calorie deficit, your body doesn't adapt by lowering its calorie consumption, at least not to the extent that it does on low fat diets. So that's something to keep in mind. Now the diet also works by, okay, everybody knows it's, it's more energy out and less energy in, but doing that is uncomfortable. It, that's the key. Like, no shit, Sherlock, but how do I do this and keep it comfortable, right? And so the way that this diet works is it addresses some of those hormonal factors that drive hunger. And the primary uh, factor behind hunger control and regulation is insulin and leptin. So what we're going to do with this diet is modulate your production of insulin and reduce the spikes and valleys that you have throughout your day in a carb heavy diet. Now when we talk about this there's going to be all kinds of people that get confused so I'm going to do a very little bit of the science to speed right by it. Primarily when you hear people talk about keto they talk about it's a low carb diet it's x number it's below 20 carbs it's below 50 carbs you know and so it's referred to as a low carb ketogenic diet or something like that so but the real truth is that the reason that we're talking about reducing the number of carbs is because we want to reduce the insulin response notice i said reduce not eliminate 
right? And so the average American diet usually has 250 to 350 grams of carbohydrates a day, all of which produces a glucose response to which you then produce insulin to regulate your blood glucose, pushing the glucose into your cells. It's all healthy, normal function, but a lot of us have too much insulin secreted in response to too many calories consumed and perhaps too many of those calories being carbohydrates. So when we talk about uh, insulin production, we talk about glucose, what we're really talking about is a concept called glycemic index. And glycemic index itself is not a hard number, it's a relational number. It means that we took a group of test su subjects and we fed them one control food, usually a piece of white bread or a set amount of glucose, and then we fed them equal calories of some other food and saw what their response would be relative to that control food, either white bread or glucose. So what we're looking at is, is glycemic index is how potent or how quickly, how high up the, the glucose spikes given a certain dosage of that glucose of a given food. And so a lot of people, um, when they talk about we're trying to reduce the insulin, they say, okay, well, if anything has a potent glycemic index, it's a problem for keto, which is partly correct. But the other problem is uh, caloric density. So the more grams of something that you have inside the food, then the more that glycemic index works because it's glycemic index times available digestible carbs divided by 100 is the glycemic load. So the glycemic load estimates how much impact that food is actually going to have. And since the glycemic index of all kinds of foods are all over the place, People, when they made their dietary recommendations and scientists, when they did their studies, decided to control the dose rather than the glycemic indexes of the foods and say, as long as we keep our dose small enough, say 50 grams a day, then the glycemic index becomes somewhat negligible because the dose is controlled, so the overall load is controlled, and we've reduced the impact of insulin, right? So if we go from 250 to 350 grams of carbohydrates every day, even if we ate high glycemic index carbohydrates at 50 grams per day, that is a way lower amount of glycemic load and a way less amount of secreted insulin and it's a major dietary intervention altogether. So the way that we got to this carb counting is to control the dose that we have to respond to with insulin and the way that people get to food eliminations is they either look at inflammation, which is bullshit and we won't cover until the very end of this video, or they look at glycemic index, which is almost right, but it looks at the wrong part of the problem. The real part of the problem is index times dose equals load, which is why I'm going to tell you there are no banned foods on the ketogenic diet. There are foods that are ketogenic friendly in that they have low net carbs and a low glycemic response and you can eat them readily without problems. And then there are foods that are only keto if you take a very, very, very tiny bite. So, uh, that, you know, Coca-Cola is out. You know, you can have an, an eyedropper drop full of Coca-Cola. That's the dose over there. So there are going to be foods like mashed potatoes that are going to be nearly impossible to include in any sane amount on this diet. So let's get started on the diet. Now that I've explained to you the background of what the ketogenic diet is and why it works, we're going to control your insulin spikes. And by controlling your insulin spikes, your hunger is going to come into play, right? It's going to, it's going to be reduced and you're going to be able to eat less calories comfortably and you're not going to feel hungry all the time. The reason for this is that insulin impedes the digestive enzyme that breaks fat into ketone bodies. So the heavier you are and the more insulin you produce, the less readily you can access your fat. There was a beautiful video on the internet called Why Are Heavy People Still Hungry? And it cuts right to the question, if you have so much energy stored, why are you so hungry? And the answer is that your insulin levels are still high enough to impede the function of this enzyme so your fat is not readily breaking down to provide energy for your body so you're hungry because you are actually lacking energy. And so what a ketogenic diet does is attempt to control this insulin so that that enzyme can readily break up fat. And when you have your fat readily breaking down and you've got that process accelerated, you have energy throughout the day, you no longer feel hungry in part because you have that energy and in part because you've controlled the insulin. So although this is a standard diet like every other one that ends up with you eating fewer calories, it ends up with you not noticing that you're eating fewer calories and that 
That is why it's beautiful. Not because it works like other diets do and you eat less calories, but because it controls the hormonal factors that make you notice you're eating more calories or fewer calories. So carbs, I've been talking about counting them. How many can you have? 50. That's going to be an unpopular answer, but forget those people. We're going to keep it basic here. We're going to keep it basic so you can succeed. The reason that I say 50 is some people will talk about net carbs. I'm going to talk about total carbs because net carbs is a complicated idea and American food labels don't work great for calculating it. There's all kinds of problems with calculating your net carbs using American food labels. So you on this video are going to keep it simple. You're going to count total carbs. You're going to have 50 total carbs a day and almost all of your carbohydrates should come from vegetables. And the reason why is the second thing that we're going to look for is fiber. Digestive issues are common on this diet and it's usually because people oversimplify their carb counting. They decide that all carbs are bad and therefore vegetables which contain primarily carbs and a ton of micronutrients and a ton of fiber are also there unilaterally bad and they don't get enough fiber in their diet. Fiber is absolutely required to maintain gut health. There are all kinds of studies that show that fiber is great for you. It is important to get your fiber. It is the most overlooked thing in this diet, in my opinion, is people do not get their fiber. So you're going to get your fiber, and the way that you're going to get that fiber is in part that you have 50 grams of carbohydrates to work with. But those 50 grams, being a higher level than most people are going to tell you to go with, has to be almost entirely vegetables and mostly the green ones, okay? So um, carrots, potatoes, corn, those kinds of vegetables are going to be problematic on this diet. Other kinds of vegetables like bell peppers and tomatoes, you can still have those, but the best vegetables for you are going to be leafy greens, spinaches, and arugula, lettuce, things like that are going to be excellent. So you're going to keep your carbs to 50 a day. You're going to target fiber. Now we're going to talk about protein. There is a huge inappropriate fear of protein in this community and you're not going to fall susceptible to that. So what you're going to look for is women, you're going to get 80 grams of protein a day. Guys, you're going to get 100 grams of protein a day. Then if you're exceptionally tall for your gender, I want you personally to add 20. So exceptionally tall females, that's 100. Exceptionally tall males, that's 120. Now, if you do really heavy resistance workouts, if you're powerlifting, if you're doing CrossFit, also if you're running marathons or doing, if you're a triathlete, I want you to add 20 more grams of carbohydrates. So that means most all women should be at 80, really athletic women should be at 100, really tall women should be at 100, really tall athletic women should be at 120, men you should be at, a, at 100, athletic men 120, really tall men 120, really tall athletic men 140. Now, protein, believe it or not, having inadequate protein can lead to poor body composition and muscle wasting and people will talk about reducing protein, breaking a stall, and they're usually breaking a stall by losing muscle mass, which is going to be harder to regain and will not help you look good in your clothing, look good in the bedroom, whatever you want to do there. So if you've got to make a mistake on protein, it's actually better to make a mistake on the upside. Now some of you will say, what about those keto calculators? Again, we're keeping it simple. but if you're going to ask about keto calculators, listen, the, the nutrients that you get when you look up the nutrition data for a piece of steak are not accurate, okay? They're, they're best guesses and there's a lot of variability. Different cows live different lives. So four ounces of ribeye does not contain the exact same number of calories before you cook it and certainly not after you cook it. How long do you leave it on the grill? How much fat drips off? All of those things impact it, right? So when I say that 80 is a good enough number and somebody says, well, my thing came up with 74, you're never going to track that accurately. We're not even going to try. So now we're going to talk about tracking. I think that in general, you should track when you start, especially to get a handle on the number of carbs that you have. And in general, if you want to track long term, that's going to help you. Again, if you stall or have some sort of problem in your weight loss journey, you should go back to tracking if for no other reason to show people what you've been eating. But when you track, you're only going to get close, okay? And you're not even going to get that close. So arguing over things like 80 versus 82 protein is, is silly. And I don't want you to look day by day. We're not going to track day by day. You're going to put in the logs every meal that you eat, every item that you eat, and then we're going to look for weekly patterns. If over the last several days, as an average, you're getting insufficient protein, you need to find a way to get more protein on the plate. If as a ratio, fat to protein, you have some sort of mistake where you're getting too much fat 
or not enough fat or whatever it is for your guidelines, you should make that as an overall change. But the idea of counting these grams exactly and only having five grams of fat left for the day and zero grams of protein, what can I eat that has absolutely no protein, that's not a healthy way to look at the diet. Your diet should be looked at in terms of weekly trends and averages. So if we're eating less than 50 grams of carbohydrates and we're eating 100 to uh, 80 grams of protein, that's going to account for something like 400 calories a day. And women are going to require 1,500 to 2,000 calories a day, men more than that, which means that the remainder of your calories are going to come from fat. At this point, I want you, especially since this is our week, month, one uh, beginner's diet, you're not going to count calories. You're going to allow your hunger regulation to work. You're going to focus on keeping those carbohydrates low, and you're going to reduce the, the 250 to 350 carbohydrates you had down to 50. That's going to reduce your insulin response. So in month one, you're not going to also try to force any sort of calorie counting, any sort of calorie restriction you're going to eat the fat that you need. So if you have 400 calories in your diet set aside for your 80 grams of protein and, well, it's 450 or whatever with, with 50 grams of carbohydrates, okay? But you have your 80 and you have your 50. That adds up to 130 grams of carbohydrates and protein combined, which at four per is going to take us to like 520. So you got 520 of your calories accounted for. What's the rest of your calories going to come from? Fat. That's over 600 calories of fat to get to 1,100, and you can keep on going. So women, you're going to eat something like 1,100 to 2,000 calories a day. Men, something like 1,500 to 2,500, and the rest of that budget comes from fat. But rather than you go into some fat calculator or keto calculator that says, you know, with your 80 grams of protein, you need exactly 103 grams of fat, what we're going to do is say that the fat is variable. It's what comes down during the weight loss phase, and it's what you use in the beginning to make yourself feel hungry, and it's what you use at the end to stop the weight loss process. You increase the fat again to meet your calorie needs. So that's going to be my opinions on the fat. So you need to get your protein. Women, that's 80. Men, that's 100 with the modifications I mentioned earlier. You're going to get your carbs, 50, almost all vegetables. Which vegetables? We're going to get into that. So you should be eating things like broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, green beans, lettuce, avocado, kale, um, all of those things and the things that are going to be the most problematic in your diet are going to be things that are starchy like root vegetables, carrots, yams, uh, sweet potatoes, potatoes, um, radishes are okay. So you're going to look for those types of things. All your leafy greens. Get all your leafy greens in. If there's a leafy green you love, start eating it. For your proteins, you're going to have the normal things, chicken, fish, eggs, beef, all those types of source. Vegetarians can do it through the use of eggs and some high-protein vegetables. Then we're going to talk about the biggest problem with the ketogenic diet is typically micronutrient composition. People are going to eliminate a lot of their sources of vegetables and fruits and some of their um, fortified like fruit juices like orange juice and so we're going to tend to have some micronutrient deficiencies if people aren't very particular about how they do their ketogenic diet and so to kind of silver bullet that I'm going to recommend that everybody look for a multivitamin camera's backwards here so you can't read this it's a centrum all right the reason I picked this one is because it had some magnesium and some calcium which are two of the electrolytes you had and a bunch of other things insane quantities that should be fairly safe for people to use so I'm going to recommend that when you start keto you pick yourself up a multivitamin and I don't endorse any given brand but I say look for one that has magnesium and calcium and a bunch of other stuff and is fairly well tolerated fairly over-the-counter fairly common no specialty vitamins needed next for your electrolytes I'm going to ask that you start taking bullion cubes. Now, if you want to roast and make your own bone broth, that would be excellent. If you want to drink bullion that comes out of a carton, that's also excellent. But we're looking for the stuff that has the salt in it, not the unsalted stuff. Some people will point out that some of these bullion cubes have some less than perfect ingredients in them, usually in such small dose, again, going back to glycemic index versus load, that it's not significant. But just for simplicity's sake, you're going to drink twice a day one cup of broth. It will help you keep your sodium up and handle your electrolytes. Um, the other thing that we're going to do as a quick is light salt, Morton's light salt. You can get other light salts, any brand of light salt, but what you're looking for is this pot potassium chloride. 
This is going to help you get your potassium throughout your day. You salt your food like you normally would. You use this. It is actually better for a keto diet than the pink Himalayan stuff. The trace minerals in the Himalayan stuff are not rare trace minerals that you don't get elsewhere in your diet. They're also not in quantities that are biologically significant. And they also contain radio radioactive isotopes and lead in trace amounts. You know, So if trace minerals are good for you, why are trace contaminants not? It's just pretty. Some people like the way it tastes. If you like your pink salt, keep it. But for those of you who are trying to figure out the cheap, basic way to do this diet successfully, light salt's the way to go. Salt your food like you normally would. Salt, you know, remember the salt. Go ahead and salt it so you can taste it. A lot of the people that are worried about salt levels and blood pressure, uh, don't be. Go ahead and use your light salt. Now, we're going to point out that you don't lose weight for about four weeks in the beginning, so you lose a lot of weight in the beginning, that's water weight, that's week one, then weeks two and three and sometimes four, you don't lose almost any weight, so I don't want you to freak out. A lot of people don't tell you that when you start the diet, you see that five pound loss in the first week, you say I'm gonna lose five pounds a week, four weeks in you expect to be 20 pounds down and you're five pounds down still, you haven't lost any more weight in the next two to three weeks. That is normal, that's part of doing the diet right. The explanation behind this is that originally you flush the uh, glucose and the glycogen in your mu muscles and with that you store water at a 2 to 1 ratio so you lose the 700 grams of glycogen and then you lose 1400 grams of water at the same time that's 2 kilos a little over 4 pounds so you lose 4.4 .4 pounds right away and then you think that things are going to be miraculous and then it takes time for your body to upcycle these liver enzymes and for your body to switch over to this new fuel source and you're going to have digestive upset and the reason why is your body can run off all sorts of fuels it's called metabolic flexibility the stuff that lives in your gut the single celled organisms that live down there they do not have this flexibility so when you take away their carbohydrates those guys starve and when you add in the fats and proteins those other guys they bloom and that disruption in the intestines is going to cause some gas some bloating some inconsistency possibly constipation which is another reason to keep your fiber up so don't expect too much weight loss in that first month but month two you're going to be burning almost pure adipose fat tissue and that's going to be where your weight loss really picks up expect like a half pound a week maybe a pound a week some people will get two pounds a week do not compare yourself to social media those people are cherry picking their results some people are lying not everything you read on the internet's true I can't believe I have to point that out but especially when it comes to diet results and people feeling good about themselves some of the reasons that you're not losing as much as those other people is because those other people are lying to you so you want to look for like a half pound a week starting in week five and continuing indefinitely many people can achieve one to two pounds a week safely what you're going to do is you're not going to weigh yourself daily. You can if you want to, but I don't recommend it. Weigh yourself weekly or monthly. But what I do want you to do is take photos on day one and throughout your process. You're going to notice that there's an awful lot of physical changes. And the physical changes, the appearance changes, seem to be outsized given how much weight you've lost. People seem to look incredibly better given that they have not lost as much weight as you might think given how they look. And it's because of some of the body composition effects of this diet. So I do want you to measure yourself. One of the best ways to do this that I've seen is a lady took yarn and she put it around different parts of her body and then she labeled the wall those different parts of her body and she taped up the yarn and over time she saw the yarns getting shorter and getting up the wall and she could tell that she was losing inches. So scale obsession is going to be a real problem especially due to salt retention, water weight fluctuation around the ketogenic diet. So when you slip up you're going to retain water. People are going to think that they've gained all this weight back but they haven't gained this fat back and it's going to induce people to do these crazy fad crash diets where they lose some of that water weight and again they think that they are losing weight fast and in success it's not. They need to look for real fat weight loss which is why we're going to measure instead of weigh. Exercise in the ketogenic diet, do you need to do it? Absolutely not. The best way to lose weight is in the kitchen. You should do meal prep if you only have time to do one thing and weight loss is your priority. However, if you only have one priority in life and that's to stay healthy and stay alive, I would say be active instead of lose weight. And when I say be active, I mean 30 minutes of walking three times a day. So if you have decided that weight loss for whatever reason is more important to your health, let's say that you're dealing with an obesity problem and you really feel that you need to lose the weight, you can prioritize your diet over your exercise. But I'd like you to reinstitute exercise later. 
if you are losing weight and you have more time, you feel that you're 100% on top of your meal prep, it would be great for you to start some light cardiovascular workouts or some resistance training. It will help with your body composition. It will further your progress. But the answer to the question, do I have to exercise to lose weight on keto? The answer is no. Um, hydration, you're going to hear about hydration a lot on this diet for several biological reasons. Hydration becomes extra important. So when people say drink a lot of water, then people don't say what is a lot of water. Unless you're on a medication that changes the color of your urine, the best way to tell is by the color of your urine. Your urine should be a pale yellow. If it's clear, you've had enough water or too much. And if it's dark yellow, you need to be drinking some sort of fluid, probably water. Okay, so that's what you're going to do regarding hydration. As far as adaptations and how you cook, you're going to use things like xanthan gum to thicken instead of flour for your sauces. You're going to use stevia monk fruit and erythritol or Z-Sweet or Swerve as your sweeteners for your, whether it's your coffee or your tea or if you do some baking and whatnot, you're, those are going to be your approved sweeteners to use in your cooking and your sauces, whatever. Those are uh, sweeteners that are artificial or natural in uh, origin that do not have a pronounced glycemic response. Um, also, when you bake and you need some sort of flour, you're going to use uh, like an almond flour or a coconut flour. Now, as for these baked goods and uh, artificial chocolates and highly artificially sweetened or uh, replacement sweeters like monk, monk fruit or erythritol, sugar alcohols, and large amounts of dietary fiber and high carb processed foods, those things are still allowed. They're still possible on keto but they should be reduced to something that you have uh, maybe three to five individual times a week such that it's contained maybe two days a week, maybe three items of food to five items of food total a week. You should try to avoid those highly processed foods, the foods that have net carbs written on the packaging. Shorthand reason is it's usually soluble fiber and the sugar alcohols will cause digestive problems and they're not the best things for you to eat on your weight loss. But for a lot of people there will be situational eating, uh, travel eating, work eating, something like that where those sorts of products will become appropriate. But do not include them as a regular part of your diet for enhanced success. And we're going to talk about the risk factors. People say that keto is dangerous, kind of. Lots of ways of eating are dangerous. Certainly high carb, high fat eating is the most dangerous. Continuing to gain weight is the most dangerous. But in general, as to whether or not keto is specifically dangerous, there are studies that have looked at it over a long period of time and found it to be generally well tolerated with generally no noticeable side effects. Okay, cholesterol tends to go up a little bit, but in general, your HDL to LDL ratio improves. The LDL seems to be fewer of the small dense particles and more of the big fluffy particles that are less of a problem. So overall, cholesterol tends to vary when you first start the diet. It may spike for your first cholesterol reading, but typically over six months to a year, cholesterol on this diet improves. Same with blood, blood pressure and other cardiovascular risk factors, as does uh, blood sugar response and insulin usage and medication usage in diabetics. So in general, this diet is well tolerated. And for all the people that are worried about what consuming these extra fats or extra meats tend to do to your heart, the answer is that your cardiovascular risk factors tend to improve over this diet, due in large part to weight loss. So of all the things that you say, yeah, but look at what he's eating or yeah, but whatever, the, the weight loss factor on cardiovascular health, on insulin resistance, on diabetic risk factors tends to outweigh those other issues. So if you're eating way too much fat and way too much carbs and way too much calories in general, a high fat diet becomes problematic. But since we're going to induce a calorie deficit through controlling the insulin on this diet, while you're in a calorie deficit, cardio risk factors improve. Um, blood pressure tends to improve and, it, and the, the weight loss and the car calorie uh, deficit seem to outweigh the food composition. Um, your schedule as far as weight loss is going to go, you're going to lose something like maybe one to five pounds the first week, then it's going to level off for two to four weeks and then it should pick back up. So that's what I want you to expect. Then there's the conversation of routine versus variety. Weight loss is also a psychological battle. It's about a diet that you can stay on long term. It's about a diet that, that you can also understand. The more different types of foods we can talk about that you can eat and how to make all these different keto recipes 
definitely adds variety to your diet that can help you stay on the diet for a long term. However, for a lot of you that have lower cooking skills or don't like eating weird new foods or don't have a lot of time in your diet, it may be a lot easier for you to stay on this diet to do a bunch of meal prep, to get to be familiar with the nutrient composition of certain foods and to do something like every weekend, cook yourself two pounds of beef, cook yourself uh, a package of chicken thighs, cook yourself 12 hard boiled eggs, cook yourself a pound to two pounds of bacon and then weigh that up and divvy it up throughout your week as your protein sources and then cook your vegetables to, to order each night. So if you're somebody that likes simplicity, look for a simple meal plan like that where you cook packages of food and divvy it up all at one time. If you're somebody that absolutely needs variety, then you may need to relearn the way that you cook a little bit. Individual preference is going to be important here. So know thyself. It's key to your success in your diet. If you're somebody who's going to need all that variation, then by all means you should figure out how to get it and learn how to cook all these different keto recipes. If you're somebody that gets overwhelmed by all that complexity, you should find a few ketogenic friendly foods that can become your home base and then you can eat those foods habitually to make sure you're staying on diet and work out from there. And then basics are going to keep you winning, you know. If you want to stay on this diet for a long period of time, a gradual weight loss over a long period of time is going to beat a dramatic weight loss over a short period of time. That's why in this video we kept it basic. I know it was long, there was a lot to cover. So you're going to take a multivitamin. You're going to drink bouillon one to two times a day. You're going to use light salt. You're going to keep your carbs under 50 primarily vegetables, you're going to prioritize fiber, supplement it if you must. Women, you're going to get at least 80 grams of protein. Getting too little protein is going to be more of a problem than getting too much protein. We're going to look at our macronutrients as an average rather than as a daily basis. The protein sources that you can get are all your typical ones like chicken and eggs and fish and avocados and all sorts of things like that. Uh, we're going to measure ourselves with string or photos rather than on the scale. There's lots of reasons for that in the world of body composition. Thinner people do not, or skinny people, do not always look better than muscularly built people. And there's a lot of things about the ketogenic diet that lend to improved body condition, um, body composition. So uh, it may show up more on your string and your inches and in your dress sizes and in your pants than it does on the scale, which is why the scale is terrible. Also with the hydration effects and the yo-yo thing that happens with salt and restoring glycogen, it's going to exaggerate your cheats and, and make you feel really bad if you pay just attention to the scale. Exercise, light resistance training or some walking would be a wonderful addition and exercise is the best thing you can do for your health, but exercise is not the best thing you can do for your weight loss. Meal prep is. Water, I want you guys to drink water, pay attention to the color of your urine, it should be a pale yellow, clear is too much and dark amber is not enough. And remember, your replacement uh, items are going to be um, xanthan gum for thickening, almond flour and coconut flours for your flour replacements most of the time, and stevia, monk fruit, or erythritol to sweeten your coffees, juices, drinks, sauces, baked goods as you go. I wish you guys all of the best luck. I kept it simple for the purpose of diet adherence. As far as anybody that's ever said, do your own research. I want you to walk away with the idea that I do not want you to do your own research. I am not a doctor, I'm just some schlub. I'm going to give you my research. But even your doctor shouldn't be offended by the concept of give me your research. Let me know what your sources are. Sources are there to be independently evaluated. That's why people have reference pages on their studies when they get published in journals. Everybody should be willing to give you your references. If somebody comes into a room and then they tell you, hey, you're doing it wrong, this is what you should eat, this is whatever, and you say, where did you get that from? And they say, do your own research. Why do they care enough to tell you you're doing it wrong but not care enough to share their homework? Quite frankly, do your own research is a red flag that means this person probably doesn't know what they're talking about and probably doesn't have citation to back their claims. So. Everything that's in this video, if you've gotten this video shared onto your wall and you're like, this guy is way oversimplifying, why doesn't he think I need more complicated amounts of protein or how dare he say 50 carbs and all that stuff and there's problems with drinking bouillon, we can discuss that in the bottom and there are nuances here but I glazed over an awful lot of them because this video is already too long and I wanted to keep it simple. Diet adherence is the number one factor for weight loss success. Keeping your diet simple is way more important than people give it credit for. So to review, 
Under 50 carbohydrates a day is the most important part. Chase your fiber and get those carbohydrates from vegetables. Adequate protein, which is going to be 80 for most women, 100 for most men. Add 20 if you're tall. Add another 20 if you're a weightlifter or you do CrossFit or you do marathons or something. Beyond that, the fat should be variable and you should allow yourself in month one to eat until you're full. This diet should not require that you restrict calories, but it will induce a calorie deficit eventually through the mechanism of controlling your insulin. So in the beginning, you may have days where you eat more calories than your body requires and you're in a calorie surplus. That's gonna be part of the oscillation of controlling this insulin. So in month one, I don't want anybody to chase calorie restrictions. Once you get to month two and you start feeling pretty consistent energy, this concept people talk about with fat adaptation, you can play around with eating less food. You're gonna find that you're not hungry all the time. You need to prioritize in that phase, getting your protein, because as you eat less calories overall, you might find that you're no longer getting your calories and you're not getting your fiber and protein composition quotients um, as you move into the later stages of the diet. So later on, month two, weeks five through eight is where you can start cutting back the calories and you'll find that comfortable and easy to do. You'll find it's natural. You may not need to impose it at all. It, it will just come to you. And that's real power of this diet is the diet adherence and the simplicity. All you're doing is trying to get your protein and your fiber and controlling your carbohydrates, maybe taking a multivitamin, drinking some Suproth and, and it's an easy diet, right? And then the other thing is that you don't feel starving or fatigued all the time because as we get into those liver enzymes I talked about breaking down your fats, that process becomes a 24 seven process. So rather than relying on that glucose that came from your last meal to power your day, you're relying on these ketones that come from your body fat and you have virtually unlimited body fat in terms of your calorie needs. Uh, a person that's at 10% body fat, which is a very low amount of body fat, especially for women, that only weighed 100 pounds would have like 10 pounds of fat and 10 pounds of fat is like 35,000 calories. And guys need like two to 3,000 calories. So you have like 11 days of calories just stored if you're already skinny and a tiny, tiny person. All right, so if you're anywhere bigger than that, and almost everybody watching this video is, you have like unlimited calories that come to you throughout the day once you get ketosis started. And that's the other second wonderful part about ketosis is that your energy stays up and you're able to do the diet comfortably. It's an easy diet. You're allowed to eat bacon and eggs and steak and stuff. And then your energy comes regularly and you don't feel like you need so much food. So it's an insulin control diet, not an insulin elimination diet for people that say, what about grains? You can't have those. They're inflammation. Inflammation is a boogeyman. There's like 12 different markers of inflammation. If you have an inflammation specific disease, then talk to your doctor about those factors and how to work that into your diet. But people can't even decide what inflammation looks like in the body or if they focus on a marker of inflammation, they can't determine where that inflammation comes from. And furthermore, things like inflammation have a role in the body. If you've ever worked out and grown your muscles, that was due to inflammation. If you take anti-inflammatories after you work out, it reduces the inflammation that triggers muscle growth and you grow less muscle, right? So inflammation is not always bad. So ignore those other people. Everything that I said in this video pretty much covers what you need to worry about. You need to keep your protein adequate. You need to control your carbs. You need to look for your fiber. You should pay attention to getting nutrient dense vegetables into your 50 grams of carbohydrates. You should consider things like eating organ meat because as far as your protein and fat composition comes from, those are the highest in nutrients. Um, you should take the multivitamin, you should drink some broth, you should have some light salt, and you should take it easy because that's really all you absolutely have to do. Are there other things that some people do, like intermittent fasting, like adding diet, dairy restrictions and things? Sure. And if you're a person that's comfortable with the restrictions of keto and you feel you can adhere to it and you want to do more or you're continuing to have problems and you need to troubleshoot, let's discuss that below and I will absolutely make videos for people with specific health concerns and that need to troubleshoot. But these were the basics. I hope I kept it short enough. It probably ran way too long, but I had to cover this whole like thing. I love you guys. Thanks everybody for coming. Uh, again, I'm not a doctor. Involve your doctor in the journey. Um, look for sources to anything you need sources to in the bottom. Don't trust anybody that says do your own research. Keep your carbs under 50. Make sure you get your adequate protein and have a wonderful day.